AI in Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting, and networking needs. Our host brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success, and their advice. Focusing on fast-tracking you to the top, AI in Action cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. To listen to the latest AI in Action podcast, head over to www.aldus.com forward slash podcast, or subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Podcasts. Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Aldus podcast. Today we're continuing with our ServiceNow series, interviewing some of the best and brightest leaders uh, from across the ServiceNow ecosystem. We are very lucky today to be hosting uh, Nicholas Janser, who currently holds the position, position of uh, Solutions Architect at Evergreen Systems. Nick has kindly offered to support our mentorship track, uh, playing some of his experience forward onto others who are starting a similar career journey or even currently on a uh, track to architect. Um, in this conversation, Nick will walk us through how he got into ServiceNow, uh, his journey to Solutions Architect, including some tipping points in his career and some lessons he learned on the way. Um, some key learns uh, when implementing the platform, as he's obviously front and center on a lot of implementations, um, and also why ServiceNow is positioned to add value for current state and in the future for organizations. So, um, Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ben. Very happy to be here. Very, very humbled to be invited. Oh, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, so, Nick, um, before we get into you know you and your uh, role, um, would you like to give us a bit more about sort of Evergreen, the the company who you're currently working for? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Evergreen is, we're an elite partner. Uh, they've been in the ITSM space for about 25 years and the, the past few dedicated completely to ServiceNow, uh, going beyond ITSM now and covering the whole platform. Um, some exciting news, we recently merged with Cerna Solutions, another elite partner, and NovaScale, a premier partner, to form the largest independent pure play ServiceNow partner in the whole ecosystem. Also, in the next few months, our brands will be transitioning to a single name, Third Era, and there's going to be a lot of news coming out, so you can follow it on thirdera.com or uh, watch LinkedIn for more information. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd read a little bit about that, and um, yeah, exciting times for all three of those organizations, I'm sure. Um, yeah, we're so, very excited for everything it brings us. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so, you know, as we mentioned, this is kind of going to go down our mentorship track. So should we start by telling our listeners a bit more about yourself and, you know, tell them who they're listening to? All right. Well, um, currently I'm a solution architect. And so what I do is I help our customers understand and align their processes to best practices. I, I'm a really big proponent of putting the process first and then uh, designing and building the solution around supporting that process. And obviously that's in service now. So we wanna make sure that we deliver the highest quality. And so that also means I spend a lot of my time mentoring other developers on the team, uh, doing a lot of code review, uh, quality control, explaining not only technical pre best practices, but uh, processes, process be best practices. And also help a lot of time with our customers, um, spend a lot of time helping their administrators and their developers uh, improve their instance maintenance habits and their agile delivery process. And one of the, the things that I really enjoy about the job is that it, it gives me a mix of teaching and coaching, but also still being very hands-on, uh, hands on the code. Awesome. And, you know, before you were, uh, you know, would you mind giving us a bit uh, of your career journey sort of before Evergreen and, and you know, maybe start from uh, a few years back? Absolutely. Um, so I've, I've talked to, to a lot of people in the community and uh, interestingly enough, uh, have kind of a similar path to a lot of them. And that's I was a customer and a user of ServiceNow before I was an implementer, before I, I got into ServiceNow's orbit. Uh, on the partner side. So my first job out of college was actually as a marketing copywriter in the creative services department of a large international publisher. And my first kind of foray into scripting was writing visual, ba uh, visual basic, yeah, VB script macros in Word and Excel to automate a lot of the repetitive things we did like hyphenating ISBNs and formatting publishing dates and, and things like that when we produced our marketing materials. Um, because of that, I was labeled as the technical person in the department and a project came along to implement a new product planning and management system. 
Uh, so marketing sent me as the stakeholder for that project. And that project happened to be in trouble. Um, and the project manager was was impressed by by what I was bringing to the table and asked me to join the project side, the IT side of the project, doing some project management work and some business analysis and things like that. And so all of a sudden, I was in IT. <laughs> I just found myself right. in IT. And I've talked to some other people, and they had the same kind of marketing specific. You know, I was in marketing, and then I was an IT journey. So I always thought that was really interesting, um, how people just kind of end up in IT. And so after that, after we went live with that system, I ended up managing the support team for that application. And then eventually, uh, I was responsible for all of the applications for our books publishing division. So it was a big publisher. They had one side of the business was books. The other side was journals. So I was kind of uh, supporting the books side. That's where I came up through. Okay. So in that role, we went through, I don't know, at least three or four different ticketing systems. Some were homegrown. Some were other off-the-shelf uh, systems. And then eventually ServiceNow came along. And I, I'm really not kidding when I say it was life changing. Mm -hmm. uh, we had never had anything that gave us the kind of visibility uh, into our work and our processes. It, it was so clear what was in our queue. Uh, we could manage and clear out work like we had never done before. And it was it was just so different <laughs> an experience, so easy to use uh, that I decided to eventually make um, make my living doing it. Uh, I decided to leave that company. I got my system admin certification while I was still transitioning. And within a few months, I was fortunate enough to find a place that would, um, it was a managed service provider. They had a small but growing ITSM practice. And they were willing to take a chance on somebody who hadn't had, you know, kind of the admin and development experience. But I brought a lot of other things to the table. And they gave me a, a shot. And uh, I've just been loving being in ServiceNow's orbit ever since. It's a great community. Yeah, it is indeed. And, and that's, a, that's a great overview. And uh, it must really help you um, having experienced sort of from both sides of the fence, uh, the, 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 the platform. Um, so in your, in your kind of opinion, you know, what makes a great ServiceNow architect and, and, and sort of what are the reasons? Well, so a, a good architect, you know, can design a solution that, that meets requirements. You know, they can, they can make the suit fit. But a great architect will put the process first, and then they design a solution that reinforces and supports that process, and a solution that can also grow as that process changes. Because um, you know, it's not about if something is going to change, it's when. So you need to get in front of that and, and design for it. Uh, a great architect isn't afraid to challenge requirements, but you have to do it in a non-confrontational non way. And you also know when, you need to know when to stop. Exactly. Um, you, you need to know when you're just not getting anywhere and, and you got to stop it. You got to say what you got to say uh, so you know you've done the right thing and you've put the right information out there. Um, you know, so often customers do things out of inertia because, you know, that's the way we've always done it or because of, of factors that really aren't core to the process or to success or to adding value. Like you, you might hear, you know, oh, we need to report on that. Well, are you going to do anything with it? <laughs> we don't know. We just need to report it. And it's an architect's job to frame the discussion around value and really put uh, the solution in terms of value. And that's that's not a thing that a lot of technical people are used to doing. Um, and when it comes to ServiceNow in particular, uh, a great architect will focus, and I kind of already said this, but not just what the requirements are today, but what they're going to be in six months, 12 months, 18 months or more from now. Um, you may or may not still be around. And so you need to leave it in a place where it can adapt to changes in the process, uh, where it can be data driven or otherwise really configurable so that the admins and developers coming after you can maintain it more easily and less expensively. And you really want it to be able to scale beyond what's done today. And uh, you know things will always change, so you really have to, to see ahead. And you may not know exactly how it's going to change, but you need your design to be able to flex and change with it. Um, also, a great architect should have a very deep knowledge of the platform and as many of its capabilities as you can. It doesn't mean you have to know every, every application because they keep adding new ones. Uh, the platform just keeps getting wider and wider. Uh, but you really need to go very deep into the platform. And then you can see uh, when you experience another application 
kind of those underlying building blocks and how they fit together. And it, it helps you learn that a lot easier as well. Um, and, and all of that is really critical for avoiding customization, the dreaded C word. Uh, and it allows the architect to find uh, creative ways to use existing functionality to meet the requirements when other developers or architects might uh, tackle the same thing through customization. Um, you know, for example, knowing how to write a business rule that negates the incident query uh, for users with a certain role. It's the one that hides all the other incidents that aren't yours if you're not, you know, the caller on the watch list. If you know how to get around that, uh, you can add a business rule to kind of negate it rather than customizing the one that's already there. And so if, if you know things like that and you have a grasp of how things persist across the transaction, you can really accomplish a lot of things. Um, but I'm, I'm not trying to say that you have to know everything <laughs> and that you really don't yeah. pretend to. Uh, you absolutely shouldn't and you can't know everything. Um, but if you're not sure, the best thing you can say is, I'm not sure about that, but I'll, I'll find out, I'll find the answer for you and I'll get back to you. And that's, that's key in building credibility and trust. Um, and just realize that giving no answer is better than an incorrect answer, especially if it's delivered with authority, because that will come back to haunt you. And I guess the, the last thing I would say about a, a really good architect is you have to know how to give a really amazing and polished demo. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect because we can't all stage everything to look like the knowledge keynotes. Um, but if something does go wrong, it's important not to get flustered. Uh, it's important to kind of understand what's happening and, uh, and not get flustered and not let things go off the rails. <laughs> Here's a, a smooth way to do it. <laughs> and, and giving that good demo can make all the difference, either, you know, if you're in a pre-sales and closing the sale, um, if you're at a kind of skeptical customer about gaining their buy-in, and you can break through users to, who just don't quite seem to understand. Um, so a, a, a demo can even go a very long way to getting that credibility established very quickly. That's great, and I, I can imagine, you know, it's all very easy to say not get, don't get flustered, but it's very difficult to do sometimes at the moment. <laughs> Having a good product, Absolutely. like a demo behind you, that you can be confident on to kind of take the take the heat, I suppose, take the heat out of the situation will be uh, is definitely yeah. key. And we hear so much about putting the process first, and also, you know, the dreaded customization world and getting back in the box as well. So yeah, some really cool points there. Um, when we look at service now, uh, you know, more more generally, um, obviously there's a lot of press out there at the moment. Um, you know, can you talk to our listeners a little bit more about, you know, I suppose how service now adds value to the customers and maybe a little bit about where you feel the product is kind of going next in its evolution? I think one of the things that really gives it value, and I've, I've alluded to this before, is the level of visibility that it just gives to users of all levels from the, the frontline operators, you know, the, the service desk managing those incidents and calls as they come in to the process managers and the owners who need to, to look at the health of all their processes and uh, to the, even to the executives who like the, the pretty high level pictures. Um, it's, it's really valuable for improving your processes, reducing your cycle times, and really implementing targeted tailored governance where it's needed because you don't want to, you know, a couple changes go bad. You don't want to lock down everything. It really helps you focus in on, on the key problem areas so that you can solve the problems without taking, you know, a sledgehammer where a, a scalpel is, is necessary. Um, certainly customers that implement more than one application see huge benefits to having multiple processes running out of the same system. Uh, whether you have data coming in from the uh, extremely open integrations that the platform offers or from users working directly in the system. You know, having all of that data in the same platform and under that same pane of glass, people like to say, uh, there's a huge amount of value to that. You don't have to worry about gathering from other systems. Uh, it offer, also offers a lot of opportunities for automating low value tasks, which free up resources for higher value work. And that's good for not only customer satisfaction um, and productivity, but it keeps your resources more engaged and, and keeps them happier. As I'm sure you can imagine, if, if you all of a sudden don't have to do 50 password resets every week, <laughs> right. uh, you're going to be a lot happier. So a perfect example of that would be a customer who's running ITSM, ITOM, and ITBM together. Of course, there you know, could give a lot of other examples with, with other applications, but this, this is kind of a, a classic example. 
Um, so you, your project man managers, your demand managers, and your development managers can see the availability of the people that they need working on their items because the projects and the agile stories are in the same system as the incidents, changes, and catalog requests and everything that they're working. So you have that, you can see the, the development kind of work that they're working on as well as the operational. So you get a whole view of their availability and you're not over uh, over allocating your resources. You're not asking for more than your resources can give. Uh, you can have developers that can spin up and down cloud resources as they need using the cloud provisioning and governance application. Uh, they can support project or agile work and they can deprovision them when they don't need them anymore. Really increases their, their agility. They don't have to go in and request servers to be spun up. They can just go in and, and do that themselves. Um, Development teams can grab incidents, problems, and other items directly into their Agile backlog using the unified backlog, which is a great new uh, recent feature in Agile development. Uh, so you can work them alongside the stories that you create manually. So again, you don't have to look multiple places. It's all in the same place to get, get work done, and that's all from, from different applications. There are other combinations that work equally well, you know, HR and customer service together with ITSM. Um, so really, no matter which applications that you pull together, there's always going to be very real and measurable value in having them all on the same platform and integrated together. And uh, for the past few years, what we've seen is ServiceNow has been really focused, very, uh, they would say laser focused is the buzzword right now, on expanding the platform outside of ITSM and really going into other areas of the business. And um, the products are, are starting to mature and they're starting to really focus on integrating with each other uh, in a, a common way, in a way that continues to drive increased adoption across the platform. There's been also a call to partners and other builders, developers, to create new applications for various industry verticals. And I'm really excited to see what that looks like. I think I saw recently um, a commercial, I think it was on YouTube, about, um, I think it was a telecoms, specific application that lets you detect outages and respond to them very quickly. Oh, wow. I've not and seen so, that. Okay. Yeah. Very, very timely stuff and, you know, solving specific problems in different industry verticals is, is going to be big. They're going to do for those industries what they've done to IC, uh, for ITSM. It's also no secret that ServiceNow wants to consumerize the work experience, you know, make work life more like your regular life. Um, and they've, they've really made huge strides in that area. You're starting to see deeper AI integration into pretty much every application on the platform. They've really gone a long way to, to improving their no-code and low-code capabilities with uh, things like Integration Hub and Flow Designer. And the release of the new UI framework uh, promises to be really flexible and future-proof. It uses web components, and so you can basically use, uh, when you build these components, you can use it, from the look of it, any JavaScript library that you want to, whether you're using you know, Ember or React or, or any of that, you can integrate it into it. And I really see this leading to a renewed focus on bridging the various applications and really making the cross-enterprise processes flow really seamlessly. Um, they're starting to put the building blocks in place, and I can only see that getting stronger. Um, what I'd really like to see, too, is a return to some normalized architecture and design patterns across the system um, so that you know teams developing and supporting the different application areas don't really become siloed. You don't want developers who can only really develop effectively in GRC being different than the developers who can only develop effectively in ITBM. And there's been a, a little bit of drift in some of those different applications and the way they're kind of constructed together. Um, but I have seen recently that kind of coming back to a standard, which is really good to see. Um, there's always going to be a need to specialize, but there's really a, a ton of value in keeping common conventions across the platform so you can keep your development teams, you know, modestly sized. You don't have to outsize them and, and have them really siloed. Awesome. That's a, there's a lot there and then some super exciting stuff. Um, so, you know, you're obviously very passionate about the platform. Um, you know, what first drew you to service now? You, you touched on it earlier, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in going a little bit deeper into that. Sure. Um, I it really was drawn to it. Like I said, it was, it was a life-changing experience. 
uh, really because of the power and the flexibility and the ease of use that it brings. It's never been easier to, to work with an IT ticketing system. And really for the, the individual user to be able to go in and create their own reports and their own dashboards and, and put that together, that hit, that was unheard of before. At least no solution that I'd ever seen allowed you to do that. If you wanted a report, you had to ask somebody to build it for you. That alone uh, was just game changing for us. Um, and I really can't think of any other platform that lets you really build an enterprise grade application in a matter of weeks or even less. And the, the platform, it's it's a work of art. <laughs> it, it really is. Right. Uh, everything that you would need to build a full application, you know, authentication and the access control model is built into the platform. You don't have to worry about it. Um, it's easy to build out your data model and create your front end. Um, you know, it may not be as custom as you'd like. It fits into the, you know, the new model. But with the UI builder now, you have control over that as well, and it's very easy. And the things like the business logic could just not be easier to implement. I mean, everybody knows about business rules and things like that, and it's it's just so easy. And they just keep getting it better and better and better. It keeps expanding and improving. And it's never been easier to solve problems. And the the ability that the platform gives you to design extremely elegant and scaling and scalable solutions is really unmatched in my experience. And I love the platform as a user, and I only fell deeper and deeper in love with it as I became an implementer. And it comes across that way as well. It definitely comes across that you're passionate and in love with it, <laughs> as, as is everyone I speak to, to be honest. Um, so as, as we mentioned before, you know, mentorship is a key uh, area we want to touch on. And um, I'd be interested, you know, looking back on your career, um, you know, what, what kind of key kind of tipping points have there been or, or any kind of key moments where you felt that you felt a shift in your in your career? Well, for me, and this is kind of embarrassing, but just pure dumb luck has <laughs> got me. <laughs> Pretty much you got to create got your own luck. You know that, right? <laughs> um, so I, I really never thought I would end up in IT. In college, you know, my degree is in business, in management and marketing. I started in marketing as a copywriter, you know, creative services, furthest thing you get from IT. Um, but when I started doing scripting and some of those more technical things, I realized how much it lent itself to creativity and to solving problems. And those are two things that I really love. Um, I also had the really good fortune while I was at the publishing company to be given the opportunity to invest a lot of time in getting ITIL intermediate certifications. And that was right around the time that ServiceNow was really just starting to, to grow. And, you know, ITSM is where it all started with them. And so that was a huge advantage of me uh, for me to have had that ITIL knowledge and also to have developed some technical skills. You know, I, I worked on the database and uh, started doing a little bit of JavaScript, still a lot of VBScript and things like that. Um, but all of that together really allowed me to grow into the consultant and architect that I am now. Um, some other key points. So when I decided to leave the publishing industry, I was really unhappy in my job. I was getting burnt out, um, just really in a bad spot. I felt like I'd been made accountable for a lot of things, but I didn't have the authority to make the changes and decisions that I needed to be able to deliver on what I was responsible for. And so I just decided, you know, it, it was the scariest thing, probably the second scariest thing I've done after becoming a parent. Um, but I left that job without having another one lined up. And my parents always told me, never leave a job unless you have somewhere else to go to. Um, it was a huge risk, but it was a really great learning experience for me. Um, I, I don't know if it comes across, but I'm actually a really big introvert. It, it's it's hard for me to talk to complete strangers, but I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to network. I had to learn how to interview properly. Um, you know, because the the really best interviews are a conversation. It's not just the question and answer, because anybody can prepare for the questions. But to really find out about somebody, even from the employee side, um, to really find out about a company. And as an employer to find out about an employee, a potential employee, having that conversation, you really can't prepare for that. So you really get to, to find out what somebody is all about. And eventually I, I found the right job. I, I actually turned down a couple um, I had really thought about taking out of fear of not being able to find something else. But I, I'm really glad that I overcame that fear and, and stuck it out and waited for the right job and the right fit. 
and eventually I, I found it. It got me into the partner space, and I, I can't imagine being anywhere else right now. Wow. And, 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 you know, everyone loves a risk that pays off. And it definitely sounds like you, you, you took the risk, but then you also took the steps to make sure that the risk was mitigated. And it's interesting you say that about interviews, because we're, we're constantly talking to people how an interview is, it's a 50-50 thing between, you know, the two people in the room. So I think that's a really, really good point. So when we look at, you know, you're obviously there on the front line, you're you're extremely hands on with the platform. Uh, a lot of what we're trying to do here is also give, I suppose, tips and tricks or, you know, advice to people that are coming or embarking on these kind of implementations. So do you mind sharing maybe some of your sort of wins, learns and potentially some of your challenges that you've you've faced along the way when it comes to implementation? Absolutely. Yeah. And, um... I'm going to tell a story that that I really like to tell um, about about one of our customers, and it kind of captures everything, uh, all of that wins, that challenges, perfect. and learns. It's it was a, a really good experience. Uh, but I'll start by saying that the two things that I always hope to come away with from any implementation are, of course, a happy customer, but you also want a really strong relationship with the customer. Um, some of the, the biggest wins have come from really more from building trust and confidence than any of the solutions, although, the, you know, the solutions have been really good. Um, but really, it's it's that relationship that, that keeps things going. Um, so one of my favorite implementations actually started out really rough. Uh, this was before I was at Evergreen. Um, and the customer was primarily a managed services customer uh, with us. And... The company had tried several times before I came on unsuccessfully to get them on board with ServiceNow, and it was really because of leadership. And there was a horror story with one of my colleagues who uh, had a really bad experience that actually was, uh, you know, ejected from the premises, <laughs> more or less. It wasn't anything he did. It was just it was a leadership challenge. And so they had a leadership change that opened the door for us to come back in and try it one more time. Uh, to get them to adopt ServiceNow, and they wanted to start with a service catalog, which is not not a typical place to start. Uh, usually, you start with incident, incident management, you know, the kind of core ITSM. But they wanted to start with the catalog. Um, so we went into the first day of the workshop uh, to implement, and there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, we spent the first day, you know, answering all of their questions. Uh, addressing a lot of the issues they brought up and, and overcoming a lot of, of objections. And even by the end of that first day, we were still just not feeling like we were we were breaking through with them. Um, and there were a, a set of very specific challenges uh, that they had. So the first challenge involves some very particular pain points that they had around their their fulfillment processes, their equipment and software fulfillment. So uh, they needed to identify where the order would be charged, and there was a, a really complicated, you know, you have to, there are a certain people who manage some budget codes, but those people can have several different ones depending on like what project they're associated with and, and a lot of other factors. So a lot going on, <laughs> um, but at least we could identify a handful of people who could approve. And there wasn't really a way to programmatically identify it, so the user would have to select it. And um, the other technical challenge of that was that the, the one that they selected had to be the same for all of the catalog items in the same order. So we had to persist that information from item to item, which is, uh, if you're familiar with the catalog, not a very easy thing to do. It's, it's possible, because we did it, but it's, it's not so obvious. Um, and like I said, the, the budget codes that they needed to use against could be different uh, depending on what was ordered. So if you have you know, a, a laptop, a certain amount of that budget needs to go against one code, uh, let's say hardware um, capital, and then another against hardware maintenance. And that would, could depend per item. So it was really complicated uh, to make a long story short. And the second invol uh, challenge was around their procurement process in particular. Um, so they had uh, a particular situation where they had equipment that would be ordered and promised to a particular user. But if somebody came along and there was something more urgent, like uh, you you'd, you had an order out for a new hire, but an executive needed something immediately, they could you know, kind of claim that order and then they would have to uh, order a new one for the, for the original order. So they basically had to reallocate the, the hardware. 
And so it was very difficult for them to keep track of that, to know what had been reallocated and what had been uh, you know, promised and what needed to be reordered. They called it Rob Peter to pay Paul was how they, how they put it to us. Yep. And then the last challenge was uh, how to automate the correct assignment group for particular tasks at different locations. So this was a, a company that had manufacturing plants at different mm -hmm. locations. Some of those locations were fulfilled by a central team and others had local teams that would you know, deliver their, the computers to the, new, to the people coming in, to the new hires. And so th those tasks could be different for different items and there was a lot of complexity to it. I won't go into the details of the solution, but um, the evening in between the first and second days, uh, I went back and I mocked up a proof of concept that on the second day I presented to them. And uh, we, we just used a couple of custom tables. We borrowed a little functionality out of field service and we were able to show them uh, not only how their use cases could be met, but also how easy it was to maintain the configuration. Um, so during the demo, they asked us to change a few things and we did it in real time and they were floored by that. They had never seen anything like that before. <laughs> wow. They were using, I think, it, like an IBM solution. And if you wanted to change a workflow, you had to stop the entire workflow engine, uh, make your changes, and then restart it and pray that it was good. <laughs> <It was good. laughs> um, and we just, we just made a change on the fly and showed, and showed it, and you know everything was fine. And so the fact that we were able to deliver a solution that met their most complex challenges within 24 hours had a huge impact. I, that built so much credibility, and that was what finally got us over that last hurdle. We got that we gained their trust. They understood that we were there to help them, and um, they ended up being one of my favorite customers of all time. <laughs> So it was a very rocky relationship to start with and just ended up being a, a very, very strong relationship. Um, and by the end of that project, they had already signed up for a second phase <laughs> to go in and do the rest amazing. of the ideas. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was an, a really amazing experience. And it, it really taught me the importance of establishing that trust and credibility early on. And that it's really the relationship that you build with the project team that's the most important part, because if there's no trust there, uh, it's just going to be continual challenges and continual pushback the whole time, and that that's really hard for yeah. both sides. And 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 I can actually hear it in your voice where as you're reflecting on it, you sound you know you're 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 bringing that uh, picture back in your in your mind of that that whole whole journey, and it's it probably was a bit challenging at the time, but looking back on it, probably a really good achievement for you. So that's yeah. that's awesome. And um, you know that there's some really core pieces in there, especially around the trust piece. And it really seems like you look you wanted to do the best job by the customer as well. So that's awesome. Um, so, you know, as we come into a close, um, one of the things we like to do here on the, on the podcast is, is kind of make sure that we're, again, just, just sharing this experience. So, you know, if you had to give some advice to younger Nick <laughs> as he's <laughs> kind of growing up in the, the service now ecosystem, um, what, what advice would you give yourself? Well, the first thing I would say is to, to not be afraid to step outside your comfort zone and mm -hmm. stretch yourself and challenge yourself because that's where growth happens. Um, like I said before, I'm an introvert by nature, but I've really come to enjoy giving workshops. That's the majority of what I do now, <laughs> is give right. workshops and, and build code. Um, I even, uh, you know, I, being an introvert, it, public speaking is, is hard, um, but I, as you practice more, it just becomes easier and easier. And I had the good fortune to be a speaker at Knowledge 2018 and Knowledge 2019, and I could never have imagined myself doing that even 10 years before. Um, so that yeah, the more you push yourself outside the comfort, outside your comfort zone, you'll, you'll really surprise yourself what you're capable of. And now it, it, it's not a problem for me at all. I, I enjoy it a lot. And I guess the, the other advice I would give myself and anyone else is to just never stop learning and to never stop growing. There's always things you can learn and it's the best thing you can do for yourself, not only professionally, but personally. Um, I don't really have a heavy development background. I'm really mostly self-taught and really mostly scripting. I don't really consider myself a quote-unquote developer. Um, 
Although, but I can develop on the platform really well because of the platform and everything it does for you. Um, but I had to keep pushing myself to, to learn new things like AngularJS when the service portal came out. That was actually what my knowledge uh, knowledge uh, workshops were about, was how to build things on the, uh, the service portal. And I've also uh, been learning AWS and Azure, getting into more, more cloud and things like that. So really, lifelong learning is the best thing you can do for yourself in and out of work. Awesome. Nick, I think that's a, a lovely place to leave it. And uh, there's some really good key messages there. And thank you very much for your time. This has been really insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. AI Action is brought to you by Aulus International, covering your business's staffing, consulting and networking needs. Aulus offer an exec search program. Aulus can help you discover how data science and AI can transform your company. With our unrivaled network of C-suite executives and senior AI professionals, we offer retained search services across the US and Europe. Get the Aldus advantage. Become a member of the Aldus community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to Aldus members. And don't forget our AI on Action podcast. Each week we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career and more. Become an Aldus member and get the Aldus advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldus.com. That's www.aldus.com. Aldus International, empowering through AI.